our point later on, so uh, everybody has to go down. Um, ladies and gentlemen and uh, colleagues, uh, family of Nama, especially Gidon and Rayela, I want to say a few words before I give my academic talk. Um, usually one says what a great pl pleasure it is to be invited and so on. I really have difficulty saying that. Uh, in fact, for the last uh, few days, uh, a lot of memories did come back from how I got to know Nama, which was already in the year 2000 in a, um, in a BA seminar. And uh, Nama immediately uh, stuck out by her fragility, by her gentle demeanor, by her beauty. You can see the picture. And as well by her contributions to the seminar, which were uh, quite different from other students. And uh, in fact, she wrote a seminar paper that after I read it, I immediately uh, told her this isn't really a seminar paper. It's an article. You should publish it. And so she did a few years later. And this is the only time uh, that I had a BA student whose seminar paper I thought could be published as an article. Uh, I won't talk about um, the MA and because Leo has done that. And of course then uh, she went, oh, but perhaps I just want to mention one thing. When Nama decided to write about uh, Binswanger and to do so on the basis uh, of original documents, I told her there's a problem with that because you need to know German. You can't really write about Binswanger without uh, knowing German. And so she said, it's no problem. I'm, I'll go to Germany and I'll learn German and then I'll go to the archive. Uh, and I really tried to convince her not to do so because I explained to her how boring it was to sit in a German, German archive and uh, so on and how difficult it, it all would be. Uh, little did I know that it was enough for her to spend the first part of the summer learning German to do the archival re research in the second part of the summer. And then came an email saying the man in charge of the archive wants to have a contract with me. I don't know whether that's the usual thing to do. Uh, he doesn't want me to see more of the material without me first signing a contract that all further research I would do, I would do with him. So he obviously also realized who uh, was working in his archive. And then in the end, in fact, she did edit uh, some writings together with Hirschmüller, with Professor Ar Ar Albert Hirschmüller of, of the archives in Tübingen. Uh, and uh, together with him, she published uh, uh, and edited Ellen West's diaries and poems. Uh, when she went on to UCLA uh, to do her PhD, we continued to meet every so often when she was back on a visit here, as one does with PhD students who go on, until uh, one day she called me to tell me that she had been back, in fact, for quite some time, but she'd been in hospital and she would stay in Israel, uh, severely ill, and uh, somehow whether we could continue the supervision in some way that uh, we had before. Of course, she had supervisors in the States, but she needed somebody to work with her uh, here too. And so uh, a supervision started uh, that certainly was the most difficult one in my life uh, and the most intensive one uh, in which we had a third party uh, death that uh, was very clear that had to wait till this was finished. Um, and that is really how she completed her PhD, uh, partly in, in very, very difficult physical conditions, but it was very clear that um, she would first finish her PhD and then, um, uh, uh, until then, uh, she would, she would uh, stick to her academic work. work. Um, how do I remember Nama really? Uh, in two main ways. On the one hand, an extraordinarily gifted, but also determined and strong young woman uh, who not only uh, had enormous academic qualities, but also really the will and the ability to pull through what she wanted to do, which uh, to work with somebody like Nama on that level was very humbling uh, to me. But on another level, I must say that there was a quality to Naama that perhaps might seem odd to you that I would like to mention it. Uh, Naama was very, a very critical mind, very sharp and critical mind. But also she had a quality to her 
uh, that I would call um, gratitude. According to Cicero, gratitude is not only the greatest of the virtues, but the parent of all others. Gratitude doesn't mean that Nama felt in debt to anybody. That's not what I want to say. But she knew how to appreciate things that were good. Humans, men, people, as well as things, art, music, dance, uh, and to be grateful for having them. And I think this was a quality that came across very strong in whoever met Nama, certainly to me, and I think was also one of the reasons why one could appreciate Nama so much, because she had this gift of being appreciative where it was called for. Now, we have an academic meeting here, and so I want to say a few words on her book. Um, her book is devoted to a central idea. And the central idea that she takes from Rorschach and elaborates on the way Rorschach dealt with it, and I think the papers that we will hear here today won't be discussions of her book in that sense, but they will take off in various directions that can be related to her book and explore avenues, I think, um, that are directly and indirectly related to her work. And the central idea is that even though we may look at static forms, at ink blocks, ink blots for that matter, the Rorschach ink blots that I'm sure you all know, we see movement in them. We see movement in forms that are entirely static. Nevertheless, we project onto them a movement that isn't there in that sense, but that we see in it. Rorschach, as Naama shows very clearly in her work, never thought of that as a test. He thought of it as an experiment, as something that one could think about and discuss about with people. It became a statistical, scientific uh, means of uh, measurement. Part of Nama's work in the book is to unearth the original experimental thinking of Rorschach that lies below the kind of scientific apparatus that has been co constructed around it. The original idea, to, to, to unearth the original idea, which is to find human movement in forms and to see what Rorschach did with it. And also how this idea came to Rorschach and how he developed it. That also is the meaning of the title of the book, Subjectivity in Motion. Because the way we see movement, whether we see movement and what kind of movement we see in static forms says something about us. It doesn't say much about what is there, but it tells us something about our inner life. So how did this idea that you can ask people about what they see in a static form in order to find out about their, their mind works, uh, how did this idea come to Rorschach? Now, Mark traces this very carefully not in the sense of influence, but in the sense of a toolbox, of what did he have available? What did he work with to develop this idea? And so she traces on the, on the one hand the scientific milieu of Rorschach uh, at the university in, in Zurich and so on. On the other hand, the clinical milieu, where Rorschach worked as a psychiatrist at the Burg Hölzli, in other asylums, such as at the Münzelinning Clinic or in Münzingen, or at the end where he was the assistant director at the hospital of Herisau, all in Switzerland. But Rorschach also spent some time in Russia, where he was strongly influenced by uh, futuristic uh, art, which is very movement-oriented. So we'll have a talk today on dance uh, and talk on movement in uh, f futurism. And uh, the main problem, the main psychiatric problem Rorschach was concerned with was catatonic disturbances, people who are immobile, people are catatonic, people who do not move. Now this is an illness that has been widely neglected in the history of mental illnesses. You know, there are lots of books on hysteria, on schizophrenia, even on obsessional neurosis, but not on catatonia. And so this is another topic that Nama opened up that wasn't worked on, uh, but that really concerned Rorschach very strongly because a lot of his work uh, centered, uh, focused on this issue of movement or not movement. Um, so focusing her analysis of Rorschach on that central idea 
really gave her the opportunity to somehow unravel the whole of Rorschach's work from a completely new perspective, one that puts him back into his own historical environment. The end of her book points towards the way the Rorschach tests, because they have become from experiments to have moved into tests, how the Rorschach test is not only a, um, a scientific, part of the scientific battery of tests nowadays, but how it has also become an icon in contemporary culture. How American artists and other artists use the ink plots as inspiration for their artistic work. And in fact, before she knew that she could not go on with her work, um, Nama thought of doing her next research on the way the Rorschach ink plots have become a cultural icon in the West since then, uh, as a popular idiom to represent subjectivity from an artistic point of view rather than from a scientific point of view. So this is just a short impression of what the book is about, and now I want to move on um, to speak of something that is related, although it is not directly concerned uh, with Rorschach at all, but I think you will see in a minute how it relates to Nama's work. Now, the way I work with PowerPoint, maybe I should say, is that I, uh, I expect you to read. Uh, you will see pictures, but you will also see a lot of text. And I won't read it out to you all the time. So the <laughs> presentation will be a kind of combination of reading and hearing. And uh, what I want to start with is an early impression that Sigmund Freud got uh, while in Rome, uh, while looking at the Moses by Michelangelo in San Pietro in Vincoli on the tomb of Pope Julius II. Uh, he visited there in the early 1900s, but the article he wrote on that is one that he published only in 1914 and even then only anonymously. Now we can speculate on why he did that, but this is not, uh, not what we are concerned with today. So we accompany Freud um, going up the steps to the uh, church and looking at Moses the way Michelangelo portrayed him. And he looks at that statue, which of course is a completely static thing. I mean, the statue doesn't move. But Freud sees in the statue movement or a potential movement, <laughs> movement of the foot, the tables. And he tries to withhold the glance of the hero, the, of Moses. So the question is, who looks at whom? Is it Freud looking at Moses or is it Moses looking at Freud? And you can see that Freud feels himself in a not very good position while looking at uh, Moses. In fact, he is put by that look that he recognizes in Moses. He feels himself put in the position of the Israelites dancing around the golden calf, renouncing the true non-physical God and instead wanting an idol. These are Freud's ideas, of course. I mean, he projects upon a statue something that is going on in his mind, but he is looking at something that doesn't move and he feels uh, he projects something on how he's being looked at by a piece of stone. There's a whole tradition of interpretation of what this statue is about. The general interpretation, as you can see here by Jakob Burkhardt, uh, is that Michelangelo portrayed Moses just before he was springing up with the tables, just before he was smashing them. So it's just the moment before the movement. It's not the movement itself, of course, but it's just before the movement. He is looking, Moses is looking at the Israelites dancing around the golden calf. So you have Moses not yet moving, but moving in a minute, looking at these people dancing around an idol, around another statue. So in a way, it's one statue looking at another statue, and Moses looking at that, and, uh, and Freud looking at that, and having his fantasies about it. This is the movement that most interpreters think follows immediately upon the movement that, or the lack of movement that is 
in, the, in Moses uh, sitting there. But Freud doesn't agree to that interpretation. He thinks this is very ambiguous. And you can see that he thinks that what he sees there in that statue is not a picture but a script, a vague or ambiguous script in stone in, of, of which there are many readings. So he tries to read the statue. And what is his reading? And how does one read the statue? He gets an artist to do drawings. And you can see these drawings, they are in Freud's article. It's just drawings that he did not himself. He commissioned them in order to represent a movement that he thinks did not follow what he sees, but preceded what he sees in the statue. So Freud's move is to say, Moses, as we see him, is not someone who is just about to move, but someone who just has moved. So what is the movement? What is the previous movement? And you can see there's a whole explanation in Freud's text of the movement that you cannot see that he's projecting upon the statue, but he's now interpreting out uh, of that statue. And he thinks that Moses wanted to get up, he wanted to smash the tables, but did not, contrary to the biblical uh, tradition. So he thinks that Michelangelo, in fact, presented us with a Moses who is an alternative to the biblical narrative. It's not a representation of the biblical narrative, but um, it is a movement in which he found restraint. Now, any of you who will read Nama's book will see that Rorschach is all about, not only about movement, but the question of free movement versus restrained movement, and the role of restraint in our movements. But I think that although Freud presents his interpretation mainly as a move from a movement just about to begin to a movement that just finished, the wanting to get up but not really, I think the main move that Freud does here is one from dealing with external movement to dealing with an internal movement, with the internal struggle he now projects upon this statue. The Moses that he sees there is one who had, who struggled against his anger and conquered his anger struggling successfully against an inward passion. And this, he thinks, is the expression of that Moses. So before we go on from here, the move from external to an internal world, he now projects upon the statue. I just want to have a very short aside. This is the entire tomb, which, of course, uh, Freud saw. And he was aware of the history of the tomb, which was supposed to be much bigger, but then was built in this way. It's interesting to note that uh, Moses is located between two women that he sits and they stand. This is also on Israeli TV. It's always the same, the same thing. Um, and these are Rachel and Leah. They stand next to Moses, and Freud simply doesn't see them. And they also have movement, but these are women's movements. Freud is only interested in the movement of the central figure, the man. He's not interested in other movements around him. But a person who was interested in movements of women was one of Freud's teachers, Jean-Martin Charcot, who was the head of the Salpetriere in Paris, where Freud was in 1885-86 on a travel grant, and where he had his first encounter with hysteria. And what Charcot did in Paris is he presented the hysterics, you can see the woman there, to an audience that was a mixed audience of doctors and the general public, so that they could look at the movement of those hysterics. And in fact, you can see on that picture some of the men writing or perhaps also drawing what they were seeing. Because the point was, at that time, in the 80s, in Paris, to draw these movements as exactly as possible in order to follow and capture the various forms of movements that these hysterics had and also to photograph them. The attempt was to create categories uh, of various forms of movement in order to create categories of illness, in order to distinguish the hysterical women according to the various forms of movements that could be seen, to, to, this, to have nosological categories in that way. This is what Freud wrote on Charcot. He was not a reflective man, not a thinker. He was a man who sees. Freud creates a juxtaposition. You either are a thinker or you are a seer, but you are not both. And you can see where Freud is heading. He clearly will not be a seer. This is not obvious already from that text. He uh, does not just want to group symptoms. He wants to go further than that. 
because he again, as he did in the statue of Moses, in fact, wants to be concerned with the inner life rather than with outer experiences. So how did Freud interpret inner pictures? Because the problem with the hysterics, of course, is that they were looking. It was the doctors looking at them and the historical women were looking, but they were looking at an inner picture nobody understood. They were looking in space and nobody could see the pictures they saw, the hallucinations they uh, saw. And they weren't listening to them. They were only looking at them. Freud, first of all, was listening to the hysterics, so there's a move here from the picture to the words. And when he was hearing about inner pictures, dreams mainly, he was interested not in the pictorial aspect of the dreams, but the way that these pictures created a story. How you could replace images with words. You can see this is from Freud's dream interpretation. His the whole book really is about how you translate pictures into words. How you realize that in fact what you're dealing with is a pictorial language that if you want to understand and interpret it, what you have to do is to compare the pictures to another text that you can assume to be there somehow underlying the pictorial language, an original text. But the work, the work here is one of translation from one text to another. So dreams for Freud are not artistic creations. They are not pictures. They are pictorial representations of thoughts. They are words. And this is how Freud goes on. He speaks about the language of hysteria. And only if you can understand the language of hysteria, not the appearance of hysteria, the language of hysteria, you can interpret. If you can understand the language of obsession neurosis, which for him is a dialect of the language of hysteria, you can understand obsession neurosis. So Freud starts to construct a whole web of languages rather than of something that you can see. For Freud, it's something that you have to hear. So you have really the movement from the picture to the sound, from the pictorial representation to words. What then is the status of pictures in Freud's text? Because then you say, OK, then all we can have is words. But in text, Freud's text, we find pictures. This is a drawing in one of Freud's texts. This is another drawing. This is a drawing of the mind. I mean, this is the oddest thing you can think of. How can you draw the unconscious? Why, if this is your view, that you should not think in, at, that you should not be captured by the things, the way things look, why do you draw pictures in your text? Well, one explanation of Freud is that he does it as an invitation to think. It's not a real picture in the sense that it tells you what the mind looks like. It's just an invitation to think about the mind. It's a comparison. So we can have some kind of scheme, but in no way should it represent what it uh, uh, shows. And it should just be actually an occasion for conjectures, for speculation. As long as you know that what these pictures show is not the mind. It's just a way of thinking about the mind. A very famous analogy that is often quoted, especially by psychoanalysts, is that the mind has to be seen from an archaeological point of view. There are various layers, and Freud goes on and on in his introductory lectures about how you can think of the mind as if it was the ancient city of Rome, in which there are uh, all these layers, and things are conserved. The, the past will always be there. It never disappears. And so he really has a rather long text about all the stages that survive, the palaces, and he goes into very detailed explanations. So you have a picture. He constructs it by word, but it is a picture. It's trying to give us a picture of the mind and how things are concerned of, conserved in the mind. But most psychoanalysts who like to refer to that do not refer to the end of the quote, which is, there's no point in that. It's inconceivable, it's absurd, it's an idle game. And the main thing it shows that we cannot picture the mind. So he goes on and on about the portrayal of Rome in that way in order to show, it, to show that you cannot portray Rome in that way, that it, there is just no way to think of the mind in this visual representation. So I think the move from looking to speaking, from sorry, from looking to hearing, 
uh, from looking at the outside to trying to understand what's in the inside, from projecting something to the outside to projecting something into the inside of others is the central move that Freud does. And of course, this leads to his third move, which is what do you do then? Of course, all you are left with is words, because the, if, if, the, if it is about words, all you can do in therapy is to use words. And so he explains, again, in his introductory lectures, the difference between psychoanalysis and what for him is other forms of medicine. So as in medical training, medical training really is a training of seeing. You are trained to look properly at the patients. This is what a regular medical doctor has to do. In surgical departments, you have to look at how the surgeon works. You have to look, you see things. Even in psychiatry, he says, what is shown to you is the facial expressions of patients. And you have to do a lot of observations to see how the various patients uh, look like. So he says, this is like somebody guiding you in a museum. He tells you, look at this, look at that. Uh, and you have your own perception. But this, he says, in psychoanalysis, everything is different. Nothing takes place in a psychoanalytic treatment but an interchange of words between the patient and the analyst. And then you have a description of the various forms in which you can talk, complain, confess. The doctor listens. He tries to direct, exhort, force, giving explanations, provoking his patients. He says the relatives are very unhappy. They hear a relative is going to the psychoanalysis and they tell him, what is this? Only talk. How can talk help you? Nothing dramatic is going on, nothing of the kind we would like to see in cinema. There's just nothing to see. And this is the words that Freud leaves us with, namely that words, rather what we hear, rather than what we see, and what we say, rather than what we draw, is what makes people happy or gives them despair. For Freud, it is all a play of words. This is why he has to translate even a statue like the Moses into a script in a stone in order to uh, really try to cope with it. And I think words in that sense is all we are left with. Words like Naama's words in her book and a few words uh, we can offer of comfort uh, to you, Ayela and Gidon. Thank you.